everybody, Mark, Centerline Systems. Welcome to part two, part two of our emergency signal kit video series, TTP. I'm not really sure what we're gonna call it, right? But if you watch part one, now we're getting into part two, which is, now I'm calling this nighttime signal, but it's really, some of these platforms or some of these tools will work in daytime as well. Others will work better, or some will work better than others, but, but we're gonna do this at nighttime. Um, but before we get into this, I also wanted to uh, uh, talk about something I, I I didn't really overlook, but I just want to make sure I, I mention it. So these are visual signaling techniques and almost everything we talked about, you know, to date so far has been visual signaling techniques, but don't forget a whistle. That's audio, not visual, but um, these are great things to have. They work both nighttime and daytime. You know, so for example, uh, let's say you were uh, in an area where you, uh, and you only had a ground flare. That's all I'm gonna, uh, I'll just use this as an example. So you only had a ground flare, but you had really thick vegetation, you know, high canopy, you know, so the ability for an aerial observer to see down into you was severely limited because of the vegetation. Well, okay, but if you know there's ground crews out there, so a whistle would be a great thing to have. So uh, not plug in one company or the other, but these are, this is a Fox whistle. I really like Fox whistles. This is really thin. Barely even gave it a little tweet tweet and uh, you can see how loud these are. Uh, and of course, everybody knows universal, you know, three tweets for a uh, danger, but you can use these as all other types of like signaling to each other. Like, so, you know, in between uh, these, these shoots, uh, Big Spoon and I were talking about like, you know, some hunting things and, you know, how him and his dad used to, you know, have certain words that we'd say to each other. So like, you know, again, if I'm looking in this direction, because this is my field of fire, my field of observation, and somebody's coming up behind me, I don't want to necessarily, you know, scare them or take them, you know, off guard. So, you know, maybe I say something at a certain distance. Well, same thing with a whistle. Like I could just give a whistle, let you know I'm leaving the stand or I'm leaving this area or that. A big chunk of ice just fell off the door. Scared me. I got a little scared. But you could use a whistle for that as well. But don't forget from an emergency signal perspective. And we'll try to bring this into the video tomorrow when we do daytime stuff. And I don't know if the camera mic, you know, even if I mic up, I mean, that'll be obviously cheating and it'll be probably over too much for the the mic that I'm wearing, that may have actually been too much. But we'll bring this out tomorrow and see if we can uh, get that in there. And then, you know, because I have to do it, right, uh, before I start talking about this stuff, uh, you've seen it in other videos, uh, especially the video on the SSK. So this one, almost everything we've talked about so far uh, tonight and what we'll talk about tomorrow, I have a version or something uh, like that inside of my SSK. So one of the ways you can use the SSK would be for uh, an emergency signals kit, right? So. SSK only at Centerline Systems. CLSgear.com. All right, so going into some of these uh, these tools or these uh, items, and I'm calling them tools because that's what they are. They're just tools, and some tools do a better job than other tools. Some tools are designed for one job and one job only. Um, I think in a future TTP video, um, I'm going to talk about this other acronym that can actually help you look at uh, items again, whether that's a knife, uh, a, a, a flare, a signal, like whatever it could be, a sleeping bag, a jacket. There is a way in which you know you can kind of like you know look at items, use a certain uh, scale, a way to judge those things. Can, you know, but that takes into consideration all kinds of variables such as your environment, your skill set, your ability to fix, resupply, and then you can maybe make a determination because if you only have the SSK but you really want to carry a pistol flare, well, is there a close second to a pistol flare that could still do the same job as a pistol flare? And is a pistol flare better than a ground flare, than a whistle, than a laser? So we'll do that in a separate video. So again, none of this is the end all be all, the only way it has to be, right? Uh, this is really more about thinking and just talking through some, some gear. So I guess first and foremost, if you remember from the first video, and I should have kept the baseball with me, but you know, we were talking about, you know, like, you know, the, the, the horizon the, and the globe, right? So if there's somebody who's 10, 20 miles away from me, and if they still have line of sight, it's not obstructed by, you know, vegetation, mountains, things of that nature, you know, a ground, an aerial flare for that distance is going to be better than a ground flare from that distance to get somebody in from that far to near on you. And then you can use another device or another way of signaling to get them, so you know they were 10 miles, 20 miles away. Now you got them within, you know, a one mile area or a half mile area, and then you can use another device to get them on top of you. And that's what we're going to do for examples tonight. I'm not going to uh, expend everything here because some of them these are like you know the last ones I have. Others I just want to, you know, again, and I'm not plugging one company over another. 
I just want to show some of the stuff off. And what we can use, we will definitely use. So aerial flares first. So for my way of thinking, again, that concentric rings, this would be far recognition or far signaling, right? So if I can, you know, so this is an Orion uh, flare gun. Everybody should be kind of familiar with this. I mean, it's, you know, obviously a pretty, you know, easy design. Everybody can understand it's super simple. You know, crack the breech, load it, you know, cock the hammer, you know, don't point it, it you know, point it in a safe direction, you know, and you're trying to signal. So obviously that's going to be up. Uh, but what I, I guess on that note, something I want to mention. So if you're using aerial flares, right, again, and if you're saying, well, an aerial flare is always going to be better than a ground flare, right? So again, I don't necessarily believe in saying never because what's my environmental consideration? If I'm in an environment where it's super windy and this guy only goes, and I'm, I'm not saying that, right? I, I, actually, I don't know what the ceiling on this. I don't want the AGL is. It's probably, I bet this is about 500 AGL and we'll see tonight when we go and shoot it. We actually... It's a little moist uh, or misty, so the snowing is stopped. It's not windy, so it's pretty good. But uh, I bet this is probably going to get me about 500 AGL uh, out of it, just judging off these. These are 12 gauge rounds. But if it's super windy, well, what's the point of this? If it, you know, I launch it, it barely gets any uh, elevation and then just go screaming into the, the forest or the water or, uh, or a snowbank. So at that point, a good ground flare might be a better option. So you got to take all that stuff in consideration, but we will definitely expend a couple of the uh, uh, Orion um, uh, signal uh, gun flares. And then now another thing to consider is like, okay, so maybe I want to have an aerial flare because again, you know, if here I am, here's the curvature, here's somebody 10 miles away. I know I want an aerial flare because it's really going to be my best chance of getting some signaling device up high for somebody to see from a distance, but I don't have the ability to carry this you know, and all these, you know, extra rounds inside of my kit bag or whatever it is, right? Let's just say you're just, you know, you could secure this to the outside of the mother scout, but let's just say you didn't have the ability to do that. Well, a small aerial flare, and there's a couple different companies that make these. This is a really small one. Clearly you could fit this into a pocket. Now this I'm not going to expend because I actually do keep this in a different kit. If I put my eyeballs on, I guarantee it probably says, you know, what its uh, ceiling is. But if this is probably shooting 500 AGL, I bet this is getting, you know, probably 250 to 300 AGL. And, you know, and if you consider that, if there's me, you know, at ground level with my air, you know, my, my flare, you know, and that's only going to give me, you know, observation from this little certain sector. But if I can get 300 feet, now people even farther away can see it. If I can get 500 feet, now people from even farther away can see it. So just some variables, some things to take into consideration. But if this is incredibly lightweight, I could store it very easily and, you know, nothing to be afraid of at all here. And I bet this thing will probably, like I said, 250 to 300 AGL and maker of this company. I'm not repping it. So I, I don't know for a fact, but I'm just, that's an assumption because I bet these guys will get three to 500 AGL. So aerial flares. And then this, um, I don't even know, like, so I, there's certain, you know, like, you know, think of gun shows and outdoor shows and, uh, maybe you can find these online. You know, these are like, you know, <laughs> so if you're in the military, you know what a slap flare is and I'm not lying. I wish I had a bunch of slap flares. Um, because those things are badass. They're super fun, right? So whether they're star clusters or parachute flares. So this is a civilian version. It's not a slap flare. It's a pull type of flare, but I really only have like two of these left. Um, and I don't know when I'll be able to get more, but this easily is five to 750 AGL, you know, above ground level. So that's the elevation I'm getting off of this. It's a parachute flare. So if the wind and the conditions are right, you know, that guy will hang up there for a long time. Nice, slow descent. So, you know, no doubt about it. Somebody in any type of aerial platform would see this from a great distance. So I really am not going to expend this because I want to keep these guys because um, I don't know when I'll get any again. So, um, and I only have a handful of them left, but if you can get a civilian parachute flare, you know, this guy is close to, a, you know, 12 inches long. They're really simple to operate, nothing to be scared of. You know, if you do something stupid when you're pulling it, because it is a pull type of device, you know, and if you're not locking up your other arm, you do have the ability to just do something like that on the wrist. And now instead of going straight up, you're diminishing, you know, how long it's going to be, you know, in elevation or, 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 you know, kind of suspended. Now, if it's moving wind from left to right like this, maybe I want to shoot it into the wind. So it's going to ride that wind a lot longer. Cause if I go straight up, it's going to get sucked down. But so you got to think about that stuff is the reason I'm bringing it up. But, um, these things are awesome. I really would like to <laughs> expend one tonight, but I don't have very many left. So aerial flares, think about, you know, far signaling, far recognition, and we'll definitely do some of the, um, the flare gun. 
uh, <clears throat> put my eyeballs on. Now something that I kind of would consider like an in-between, so again, you're thinking of those concentric rings, this might get the attention of somebody from a much farther distance away, and then once I get them in a little bit closer, I've got a couple other tools that I could use to bring them in. And there's all kinds of different uh, you know, manufacturers of these things. So this is a military strobe light. Now, I wrap mine up so the switch doesn't inadvertently go to on because there is an IR shroud on it, you know, and then you open the IR shroud, that's infrared, and then now it's visible light. So we'll do this guy here tonight in visible light. So it's not an aerial, right? So this is ground, but I can still point it. And if I have it like this, and you know, if, and it, well, if I could even get up into a tree, I mean, that would be great too. But like, this is really bright and is really gonna catch somebody's attention and cause it's a blinking. So that's a great uh, point to, to make. What's really nice about the aerial flares is when you think about it, there's movement involved in addition to just the brightness. So it's not just a bright flare, it's going up and, you know, and it's elevating and then it's, and then it's floating to the ground. Well, that's movement, right? So if I can make there's some movement out of this, now this is a laser pointer and uh, we used to carry these things, we used to call them green wands of death, but uh, this is a civilian version of one and, uh, and I think hopefully this will come out in the video tonight, but this is a great thing because I could use this aerial flare to get your attention over here. Now you're circling my area. And depending on the strength of the laser pointer, you know, it, it, that'll depend on how far its reach is and its visibility. So, but this right here, if I got you to come down into this area, I can now start shining this against a surface, whether that's a ridge line, whether it's a bunch of trees, and I can get your attention and then I can rope you into me. So I can go like this, get your attention, oh, what the heck is that? And then I just start bringing this back over to me where I am, right? So we'll demonstrate this. It can be a far recognition. I kind of like think of it in like, you know, different concentric ring a little bit closer. And then this is another like, you know, personal little beacon strobe. Um, I'll do that one as well. So again, I can set it up and it will get some aerial observation, but it's almost more a little bit better for, you know, direct line of sight. And it's got a couple different uh, uh, settings on it. So instead of just being a light, you know, I can get a blink and I can get it. This one actually has an SOS dot, 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 dash, dash, dash. So this, that type of movement is also going to be drawing attention, right? So these are kind of good uh, signals. We'll definitely use these guys tonight and show them off. If I don't get my finger stuck in there, oh my God, it's a Chinese finger trap, except it was made out of rubber band. All right, so moving those guys off. All right, and then so moving on over to our ground uh, type of signaling devices. So again, you think of concentric rings. So we're getting much closer to us, the individual, the area that we want to draw the attention of the searchers. You know, we want their attention, you know, to be drawn towards us. So, you know, uh, we've got a couple different devices here and I think, um, and as I said, you got to look at, you know, your environmental considerations, you know, what you're carrying, how you can carry it. But one that's, you know, a, a very nice, easy to make is just your own homemade buzzsaw. So it's a chem light, right? So this is a blue chem light. This is green. Uh, okay, now I'm just even bringing that up, right? So colors do matter, right? So because if you think Roy G. Biv, which colors disappear quicker, you know, or, or, or first, or you know, within, within the spectrum at night, certain colors will disappear. They'll be harder to see more or faster than other colors, right? So you know, do your little research and figure this stuff out, right? But blue and greens, pretty good colors. Um, just throwing that out there, but all right. So a, 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 a buzzsaw. So if I have a chem light and I got shoelaces or I've got 550 cord, what's nice about this is I can you know, connect this because by itself, a chem light doesn't put out a whole lot of light, right? It's not a really good signaling device by itself. But the moment I can attach that cordage or something to it and I can start spinning it around, and that's why it's called a buzzsaw, and hopefully the camera will pick this up and you'll see it. When I start spinning this thing around, that chem light then starts looking like a light and it's very, very easily seen. So again, it's not just the light sometimes by itself. Now on, on, on some of these uh, devices, I mean, the lumens on these things are crazy. So the light is by itself. It is a really visual you know, signal, but other times it's the light plus some movement added to it. And that's what you're getting out of a buzzsaw. Um, and before I go into these ground flares, this is a, kind of a, I don't want to say a unique one, but it falls into its own little category. So I do think this falls into the, it's much closer. You're trying to draw some attention to yourself. Um, it's not going to get the elevation that you're going to get out of some of these other devices, but I'm sure, but they're lots of fun. And I'm sure many of you guys recognize this and, and or have heard of it. This is a dragon's breath, breath round. So um, off the top of my head, I think the company, I'm, I'm sure there's multiple companies, but the one company I know of that actually sells a lot of signaling device is called FireQuest. 
So what's kind of unique about these Dragon's Breath rounds, not only are they just awesome and fun to shoot, um, but they will give you some elevated signaling as well. Now you've got to be a little bit more careful, obviously, with this than you do with these other type of signaling devices, because this really is an incendiary type of round. Um, so, you know, you don't want to like, you know, shoot it up and have all of it spilling right back down on top of you. Um, uh, and matter of fact, there's a great segue. So some of these other devices will cause fires, you know, and you can use them as, you know, field expedient, you know, fire starting uh, devices. And actually, I'll talk more about that. I, or I'll actually, it's a good segue to come into the ground flares. So I have started fires with the, this before, right? And I'm talking like a brush pile where I don't have an accelerant. I just actually have tinder and stuff. It's like a normal brush pile. And I've fired into it with a dragon's breath and have started on fire. I've, you know, it's obviously much easier to do if there's an accelerant in there as well. But uh, matter of fact, I think what we'll do is I'll get the video off of my phone of cousin husband with the whole dragon's breath nuts, you know, and we'll throw that in at the very end because it's just kind of funny. And this is from years ago. But, uh, but anyway, these are also, so if you were out hunting, for example, and you're already hunting, you're bird hunting, let's say you're carrying a 12 gauge, you know, you know, they're pretty just, you know, they're marked, you know, as something like a warning you should be taking a, you know, look at, put them in a different pocket, keep them someplace safe. But if you really needed to, you know, this would be a signaling device and you can also use it to start a fire. Dragon's breath in a fire? That's just gratuitous. And then on that note, your ground flares. And obviously, so if you have a, a big open field, the ground flare still will have functionality as far as aerial observation. But if you've got a lot of vegetation, a lot of canopy, the ground flare is going to be limited in how well, you know, aerial searchers are going to see, see you. Um, and these are, they're not all made the same, right? So again, I kind of mentioned before, this is what's fun about this is get some gear if you can afford to do it and get, get enough where you can like play around with it and educate yourself and familiarize yourself with your gear. You know, there's no point in having something that's so complicated and, and, and it's so expensive that you never get to familiarize yourself with it. And so when you, the first time you need to do it under duress, when it matters, you don't know how to operate, you know, your tool, right? Or it's too complicated and, and, and not everyone in your party, you know, can use it, right? So you want to have a keep it simple, stupid, you know, philosophy, but you also want to orient, you know, and again, educate yourself, get yourself accustomed with the gear. And so what I'm meaning by that by on flares is they're not all the same. Some have longer burn rates than others. Some burn short some burn hot and I actually, and some flares, and I actually did this, what, four years ago, I tried, you know, kind of the same thing. I was messing around with a bunch of brush piles on the property and I didn't matter if I had an accelerant or if I had um, just Tinder, a lot of ground flares, because again, they're assuming, and it's a safety thing from the company, they're assuming you might actually have this in your hand. So it really doesn't put out that type of flame, you know, it's putting out it's burning an incandescent material and it's really high lumens, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be, you're going to be able to use it as a field expedient fire starting device. It's either that or I'm a knucklehead, which I admit I am, but I, you know, on, I'm not going to say what, but on a certain company, I could not get a fire started with one of these things to, to save my life. And thank God I didn't have to rely on it to save my life. But as a signals device, it was actually pretty good. It was a really, really bright, huge alums uh, ground flare. Some of them burn longer than others. So again, look at that packaging, maybe do a test burn. So, you know, again, this isn't timing fuse. You know, you don't have to like, you know, necessarily like, you know, cut off chunks, measure a whole bunch, you know, measure some chunks, cut them off and then do test burns to get, you know, your average of how long the timing fuse really works for, you know? So some of these things like, so back in the day, you know, I mean, I'm seriously back in the day, you know, this is in the eighties. I was in a light infantry type of unit. Uh, this was something that we, and we practiced ambush a lot. And so you're only supposed to spend so much time on the objective. Then you need to get the hell out of there because you're, you know, you're just thinking that the bad guys are going to come back or reinforcements. So, you know, back then you could get three minute flares, right? You know, so you'd throw these things out there on the edge of the, of the objective. And as these flares are dissipating, you know, so that way the squad leader, the assistant patrol leader, whoever's in charge or the platoon sergeant isn't having to sit there and try to look at their watch they can still see in quarterback. And as that light is going down, that's a timing thing, right? So they're no, Hey, we're getting close to three minutes and he starts calling people off the objective. Right? So think about that because, you know, if you've got an aircraft out there and, and it's limited, you know, visibility because of the terrain and you only have a ground flare, and I'm not saying this is one of them, but if you only have a, a ground flare and it only burns for two or three minutes, 
You either have to time that at the right point where that aircraft has good line of sight and it has, you know, line of sight for a long enough period of time to possibly see this, or you have to go to a larger ground flare that has a longer burn time. So even if they miss line of sight as they're flying around, they'll catch it again here or they potentially catch again here or potentially catch it again here. So just again, they're all tools, but it's not just, well, here it is good enough. I have a ground flare. There's a lot more to it than that. Are you gonna like, do you want a ground flare that you think that you could, or that you wanna rely on? So again, let's just go if you're, let's say you've got a big field and you've made a series of, um, of, of, uh, you know, of like teepee style fire structures, you know, like that you wanna ignite quickly and be able to throw green wood on once it's, you know, it's burning. So you get all kinds of smoke going. Well, okay, are you gonna run around between all three of those, you know, with a big lighter? Maybe, I mean, if that's all you have, do you have matches? But, but if you had something that you know could light that tinder and you could just light this once and then and it would still be lit and it would be reliably lit you know when you go to every of your three or four or five fire pits you know your markers well then that might be something that you want to carry right so just consider that kind of stuff when it comes to these ground flares. You know, another thing obviously is like your storage consideration, you know, how are you gonna carry them? You can see, you know, different sizes, different devices, you know, some burn longer than others, some burn at a higher intensity or, you know, illumines than others, candlelight, you know, some will start fires, some won't start fires, you know, and there's a pro and con of that. You know, if I'm gonna carry this in my hand because, you know, this is dual use. I mean, I could obviously, if my car, you know, gets wrecked, I can hang on to this thing, right? And, you know, I may not want to hang on to it when it gets like this far down, but you know, don't be afraid of this when you start. Well, actually it'd be that way. Right. But you know, when you light it, you know, don't be afraid of it. It's going to burn for a little bit. It's not going to reach out and bite you unless you do something stupid, like, you know, Oh, what's that? You know? So familiarize yourself with the tools, learn about the tools, you know, kind of make your own considerations. You know, what, what the, is the, um, the area that you're operating in? You know, I already went over this. So blah, blah, blah. And we'll talk about, like I said, we'll actually do another video on that and break that down in greater detail. All right, but we're at that point now, talk. Oh no, I got one more. So ground flares, you know, they, they can work, work both for ground and aerial, you know, observation. Uh, they do have some pretty good burn times. And, you know, again, that's like when it's really close to you to get them right on top of you uh, type of flares. But here's some other things I kind of want to play around with a little bit tonight, just for some shits and grins, right? So this is a basic weapons light and it has, uh, you know, uh, uh, visible and IR type of uh, capability. It's got white light and it's got a red light pointer. I think I'll just bring this with and see if we can rope in with this. I mean, I know the candlelight uh, or the lumens on the light itself. This is an old one, right? You know, cause I'm old and it's been a long time since I was doing this stuff, but, but this light in itself isn't super bright. It's not designed to be that right. But I want to see how this laser actually works and to see if like, you know, there's two ways. Will, will the camera pick it up or will Big Spoon be able to see it? It's a red light. It's nighttime, you know, almost 300 yards distance. We'll see how this guy works. So that's another one. So, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because again, if you're hunting, I mean, some people carry this stuff around, right? It, it's, it is a visual signaling device. So don't forget these type of things. This is a much smaller uh, type of personal beacon, right? It's really more about like, you know, if you're doing patrolling and well, whatever the case is, but I'm not sure how this is going to, uh, how this is going to be observed tonight, both with the naked eye and with the camera. And these guys can come in both visual. Now this is gonna be a red beacon. And then they'd also have IR versions of these things. So I don't know how this is gonna come out, but I just kinda of wanna see. Um, I haven't you know, looked at one of these. And, and truth be told, more often than not, when I ever saw these things is we were all under night vision you know, devices. So they stand out like you know, a blazing sun under night vision, so the naked eye. And then I wanna have, fi finally, I would just wanna have a little fun with my Yuko candle. I, I love these little things uh, you know, at my old place. I, especially winter time, I mean, that's how I kind of went to bed and woke up, you know, not with lights on, like you see, but like with my candle and they've got these kind of cool little reflectors that come with. And if you think old school candles, you know, they used to have that reflector behind it and you'd walk around with your lantern and, and that reflector would cause light like a flashlight. I just want to see how this is going to show up to the naked eye and the camera at like, again, almost 300 yards. Um, nice about this. So again, so from a very near ring of your circles, concentric circles from a very near uh, perspective of uh, visual signaling, it's kind of cool. But what's also nice about these guys is, you know, it also puts off some heat. So, you know, you think about your survival shelter, your tent, whatever the case is, you got this little candle, you are generating some heat. And if your sh shelter is good enough, you know, that actually might be enough to keep you going, you know, depending on what you have. Uh, this guy isn't going to put out any heat. You're not going to like, you know, put him between your hands, say, oh, my hands are warm. But, you know, this guy actually will put out a little bit of heat. So we'll see how good he does with that reflector, reflective mirror. 
And again, that's not what it's designed for. So I'm not dogging Yuko. I, I, I love this thing. I'm just kind of curious to see how it's going to work out. So on that note, talking ain't doing. That's just uh, kind of some around the world, you know, you know, macro to micro, big to small, whatever you want to say, signal and devices, thinking aerial. Again, the whole goal here is to start. I hope that you're starting to see this whole thing that goes through my brain anyway when I think of concentric circles because that thought process also applies to your emergency signals kit. And that's what we're going to do a little bit here tonight. Hopefully, we're going to have some fun. Uh, I know I'm going to have some fun on my side. I'm going to be the guy who gets to shoot and light some of these things up. So, all right, on that note, we're going to pause and get kind of dressed up and everything. Then we'll go outside and start doing it. All right, stand by. Ten four. go ahead on the bus, sir. Uh... Buzz saw is coming in nice and clear. All right, I think we'll just stay right here. It's only 200, but I think that fog is going to really kind of make it more difficult. But so if this is showing up and you're getting good video out of this, you know, so I'll actually just, you know, I'll do a couple things so you can just keep videotaping, seeing how this stuff shows up. Sound good? 10-4. Go ahead with strobe light demo. All right, and here comes the strobe light. This is from about 200 yards out. Proceed. I could pick up a green laser, but I could not pick up the roping in technique. Okay, let's see if I can do that. Uh, I'm going to shoot on the one of the tree lines here behind me. Let's see if you can pick it up on the tree line. That might actually make it easier to see it roping into me. Here we go. Nothing. All right, you're not seeing that. I'm shooting it due north to me. You're not seeing it reflecting off the tree line. Negative. All right, I'm shooting it to the east right now. Do you see it reflecting off the tree line to the east? Negative. All right, I'm shooting it down to your direction, but to your right. You see it reflecting off the snow at all? Negative. All right, now I'm shooting it over by you. Do you see it reflecting over by you? Yes, I can see that reflecting. Okay, now see if we can track that into me at all. Uh, we lose you once you get back down towards you, but it, it picks it up a little bit. Okay, because you know, with my visual naked eyes, I mean, this thing is so bright. I mean, like, so this is, can, so what about you, just your eye? Are you able to see this at all without the camera? Oh, by the na naked eye, I can see it crystal clear. And then, so this is maybe some good audio that we keep in, you know, if the camera picks this up. Like, so the camera's not picking this up, but what I'm doing, you're seeing with the naked eye all day long, super crystal clear. Is that correct? That is correct, even more so with the little bit of mist in the air, I'm picking up the beam of the laser so I can actually see where it's coming from. And I was just going to throw that in there because that mist is totally... 
totally refracting through the laser beam. And especially when I do this a little bit, it's making a big cone. I mean, like, that's why I'm, like, really depressed that the camera's not picking this up. Because with my naked eye, this is like, you know, holy crap, you can see this all day long. Yeah, naked eye, the green laser uh, technique is working really well. Um, the camera is sadly not picking it up. Roger. All right, well, then we got some good audio to go with this for this footage, and then, all right, I'm going to stop it, and I'm going to go to the next device then. 10 for it. Beacon, here we go. Have good on the solid. All right, so you can see that right now pretty good. Like a big green ball of light in the distance. I'm going to start rotating to other settings. Roger. That should just be steady flash. Roger that. Steady flash. Coming in clear. Okay. I'd go ahead with the weapons light test. Good visual on the red laser. I could see it on the camera and on Naked Eye. And you can see me back to me from you? Uh, up to a point, yes. Uh, it is coming in better than the green did. Okay, that's probably something weird with the lens because this guy's nowhere near as bright or as visible as the green. Ten four, go ahead with the Yuko candle reflective sleeve. All right, I am facing due south, right towards you. The reflective sleeve is pointing towards you. I highly doubt you're going to see this, but but you can see with the naked eye. Is that what you're saying? Ten four, I see a light in the distance at about two hundred yards, and I can tell it is not natural, and it is moving back and forth. Oh, the camera's starting to pick it up a little bit now that you're moving. I just started doing this because, you know, when it was static, if the, you know, but I'm glad to hear that you could see it because, again, I like this thing. I have visual of the survival match. All right, Mark. Pistol flare test. All right. Doing pistol flare test in five. Roger that. I picked up the projectile leaving the the weapon and uh, while it was in air. All right, let's try one more, just to make sure. Roger that. Pistol flare number two. All right, here we go. I'm going to do the same angle, same shot. So pistol flare test in five, four. Good visual. Hand flare test. Good to go. Hand flare test in five, four. Uh, Naked eye, I can see the directional, but uh, at the distance in the camera, it's not coming up super good. But if you give it a little bit of a wave, it does pick it up a little better. How's that right 
there. Pretty good. I'm getting getting the movement on the camera, seeing it in the distance. All right. Well, I think I'm just gonna kind of walk it in towards you because we got 15 minutes of this bad boy. Roger that. Bring it on in. In that point where I don't want to fuck around with it too much more. Because I don't want it to melt right down into my hand. There we go. Okay, so this is the end. You know, we've actually come back out of the field and uh, we're just sitting here kind of like messing around. But this is exactly what I was talking about earlier in the video because the atmospherics have changed and, and it's the temperature's dropping a little bit. We still got a big cloud cover and look at that smoke. That's from one of the hand flares and it really isn't doing anything. It's just kind of sitting there, but it is starting to spread out a little bit more. I mean, and so it, but it's really lingering and just kind of floating up in the air so even this flare might have the secondary effect of under these conditions could that smoke rise up enough during a day daytime event with these type of atmospherics where that cloud actually could augment you know you got the visual of the flare itself and the the, the lumens the candlelight but then you also got this cloud because you know now we're kind of losing it on the on the camera a bit but it's it is still maintaining itself it's a big you know ball and it's just kind of floating up it's not dissipating. It's not just shooting straight up. Well, see, now you can see. Now it is kind of going up just a little bit. See how it's breaking down? So that's just an example. I mean, it, we were just watching this, and I said, oh, hit record real quickly, because this is an example of what I was talking about earlier in the, in the video. When you're thinking about smoke from a fire, smoke from a smoke grenade, or any other type of signaling device, it just doesn't do what you think it does in the movies. Atmosphere and the environment plays a, plays a part in it as well. So I think that's really about it. All right, we're ending uh, this uh, episode two, I guess, of our signals kit, nighttime signaling here uh, video. There's an owl hooting just to the south behind us. But so I mentioned atmospherics earlier and we just shot a brief uh, little video and we'll try to get that in there too, where this hand flare was burning behind me and you could see the smoke and you could see how this atmosphere was causing the smoke to just kind of rise up and not really spread and dissipate which actually could be a benefit for some type of signaling. But the other thing I wanted to point out, because we're just sitting on here BSing right now, but earlier when we came out to shoot this segment, there was so much mist in the air, right? And through fog, mist, water, smoke, light doesn't penetrate and I have this really good flashlight. And I'll, I'll show it uh, when we shoot tomorrow's segment, but you couldn't see the wood line behind me and that's 260, 270 yards away. But right now, I'm just looking over my left shoulder and with my naked eye, I can see it as clear as day, even though there's no illumination, right? There's cloud cover still here, but there's plenty of snow. It's a big open field and I can see it like there's no tomorrow. I also have the help of a lightsaber, which is what we'll explain at some other time. But anyway, I just want to wrap it up saying, you know, the atmospheric conditions really make a, dis a, 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 a make a difference and how well you're signaling uh, tools can work, right? Because under certain conditions, they won't work for crap. Other, other conditions will work good. And that is both in terms of light, smoke, noise, you know, if you're doing a whistle, that kind of stuff. So I just want to end it on that. So I guess this is, uh, I guess this is the end of episode two of our signals kit. Tomorrow we'll be doing episodes three, maybe episode four. And, uh, there's a Star Wars joke in here somewhere about episodes and our signals kit and a lightsaber. So on that note, all right, we'll see you in the morning. All right, everybody be good. Woo! Oh, my God.